Hey, I'm Allison. I am a reading specialist and I have a literacy blog called Learning at the Primary Pond. And I've been getting so many questions lately about how do I teach small groups remotely? How do I teach small groups online? I know that a lot of us are not having our normal school year. We're teaching virtually. We're not there with our kids. And um, small groups can be really fun and I love being able to engage with my kids that way, but it can also be really challenging. So in this video, we are going to go over some tips and what's working really well for me when it comes to teaching small groups remotely. Hey, Shante, so glad you are here. I would love it if as you're joining, you would just share in the comments, um, like what grade you teach. And then maybe I'm assuming if you're watching this, you're teaching remotely, but maybe, you know, how your small groups are going so far. And then also feel free throughout, ask questions, tell me what challenges you're facing, and we can definitely work through those because just know that you're not alone and that this is really, really difficult. Um, doesn't feel like normal school, so to speak. So absolutely feel free to share your challenges. And I would also love to know what grade you're teaching because it helps me get a feel for who we have in here. All right, so you should be able to see my little presentation slide here. Shante says first grade, Amy teaching title one, so kind of similar to me. Looks like there's some back and forth. Hey, Jennifer teaching third grade remotely. K1 title teacher, awesome, Pam. Thank you all so much for sharing. All right, so I guess we're gonna get into it. Um, well, I guess before we start, I should say that what I'm gonna share with you um, if you're somebody who loves to spend like hours and hours planning like the most elaborate lessons in the world um, and stay up all night doing that, go you. But what I'm gonna share with you is not that. So if you're somebody who likes to keep things simple um, but meaningful for your kids, have them be engaged but without spending a lot of time planning and prepping, then this is absolutely for you because um, you know, do I get to do all of the games and the fun stuff that I normally do with my students if I'm there in person? No, I have to keep things a little simpler, I found. But we're still having fun with it. We're still having a good time. And when you keep things simple, often that means less planning time for you. So if you want to spend less time planning and just keep things simple but effective, then this is definitely for you what we're going to talk about. Okay, so whoops, scroll down too fast there. We are first going to talk about some of the challenges that come with teaching small group online. So again, I would love to hear your challenges in the comments, but some challenges that I face that I've heard from other teachers too. Number one, how do you share the text with the kids? Because when you're in person, you can just pass out copies of a text and then they read easy peasy, right? But not the same when you're online. Number two, how do you get a sense of how individual students are doing? I know for me, when I'm teaching small groups in person, you know, they're, depending on their level up through about like late first grade, I'll have them whisper read. And so what I teach them in person is I'll kind of like tap gently on the table, but in front of them. And if I do that, that means I kind of want to listen in and I want them to read a little bit more loudly. So whether they're reading, you know, whisper reading or silent reading, I get to hear my kids read. Not every kid in every group every day, but I do get to hear them read. And so, you know, with remote teaching, if you're doing something like we're doing here, maybe you're on Zoom, maybe you're on Google Hangouts, like how do you get to hear them read? How do you get that same sentence? Because I mean, you know, there's just so much more that you learn about your readers when they're sitting at the small group table in front of you, but that's not the case, right? Another challenge, how do you keep their attention and make it engaging, right? Our little ones are easily distracted and, and even more so when it's this, you know, online setting, right? Like they may be used to playing games on their tablet or their computer and, um, you know, we're not as exciting as a video game. That's okay. We're going to talk about that. And I would also love to know what challenges you are facing because I want to make sure that we address all of these things that are tricky. Um, and the nice thing about doing this on Facebook here is that you can contribute ideas too. So if you have something that's working really well for you, or if you have a challenge, I'd love for you to leave it in a comment. Emily, um, yeah, so assuming that everything goes well, fingers crossed for good technology, this will be available later to view. So yes, that is the plan. Okay, so those are the challenges. Would love to hear yours as well. One big challenge that you might have is where to find text, right? Because 
I know some teachers actually are able to send home like print copies of books that they print off and make and maybe they do packet pickup every week and so they can get some um, you know books to their kids and that's great and that's how they do their small group but for many teachers you know they're not able to get hard copies of text so it's like how do you get them the text actually Brittany just mentioned this she says sending home books home is difficult they don't have them at grandma's etc yes so let me share with you the places that I'm using text from and I'm going to list a bunch of different options and I'm actually using from all of these options, not all in one lesson, obviously, but for like different kids, different groups. So one great place that you may have heard of already, because I, I love it and I talk about it a lot, is ReadWorks. ReadWorks.org is totally free. Now I recommend this more for like later first grade and up. Um, love ReadWorks and they do have some stuff that's designed for kinder early first grade, but I don't love a lot of the decodability for it. So I would say like later first grade and up. Um, but what I do, so I went into my free ReadWorks account and I clicked on an article, but then let me see if this works. Well, hopefully this won't mess anything up. Um, okay. So there's also this option where I can go into, it's technically for projecting your screen, like on a smart board or whatever, but I click that little projectable option because it gets rid of some of the other junk on the screen. And um, then I can zoom in a little bit. You can actually like, well, let me do it. Yeah, so you can actually like highlight words here, which is kind of nice. You can color code, um, you can do comments too. Not that that's really helpful, but that is a way of showing kids a text and it's free. In a minute, we're gonna talk about how they actually read the text because that's a whole other ball of wax, right? Um, but this is ReadWorks, again, that's free. Um, another resource that I use sometimes is Epic. You may have heard of Epic before, but one of the nice things about Epic, well, A, it's amazing that it is free for educators and you can actually have your kids have logins. And it, I haven't used it because I do reading intervention, but it looks like you can have them log in during the school hours. And so if you read a text with them during guided reading, they can actually go back and reread the same text, which I love having them do for fluency they can log in and they can reread the same text. So that is super nice. So you can search by reading level. There might be other leveling systems too. I think that I set my settings to the Fountas and Pennell levels, but you could, you know, if I'm looking through levels L through O, they are leveled here. So that makes it a little bit easier. Um, the nice thing about this is that it is like, it's really, it's really pretty books. It looks like, you know, more of a real book. Um, there's not as many as there are, you know, texts as there are on ReadWorks, but it's really lovely. And again, it's free. So Epic is a good option. Brittany says, love Epic. Actually, we have two different Brittany's loving Epic. I love it. Yes, super helpful. So we got ReadWorks, we've got Epic, Get Epic. Um, and I believe I left all of the links there in like this post, wherever the text is. Okay. So some other things that I personally am using, if you happen to be a member of one of my literacy clubs, um, so if you're in the kindergarten club, you get a, you get new decode, not decodable, new level text every single month. If you're a kindergarten literacy club member, I'm not opening the club up again for new members until January, but if you are a member, you can use those texts. Um, what you can do is just, just like I'm doing right now, you can screen share, you can do that on Zoom, you can do that on Google Hangout have a live video with your kids, just like I'm doing with you right now. And you can project your kindergarten literacy club book. If you're a first and second grade literacy club member, you have these passages. I just read this with a kiddo the other day. Um, so if you are a club member, then make sure that you do make use of these passages because then they're actually PDFs and you can have the kids reread them afterward on their own, which again is wonderful for fluency. So that's some of what I'm using. Um, so it's kindergartenliteracyclub.com or firstandsecondgradeliteracyclub.com and the clubs will open in January. Um, another thing that I'm using is my digital guided reading books. So right when the pandemic started, um, one of my friends helped me convert the guided reading books in my guided reading bundles to be Google friendly. And so it's, it's like a Google Drive file, it's Google Slides. And it looks kind of like a normal book where it's got that setup. It's got kind of like pages. And then if you happen to use Google Classroom, 
you can always um, give a copy of the book to your kids to A, practice rereading, but B, they also have like these little things where the kids can like type about the cactus, right? So if you use Google Classroom and you use my digital guided reading books, this is something that can serve you during the lesson itself. You can screen share, you can, you know, point stuff out, whatever, but then if you want, totally optional, but if you want and you use Google Classroom, you can actually give them their own copy of the book so they can reread, type, whatever, for like the lower levels, it's like they're drawing lines, something simple. And if you don't have my digital guided reading books, they're in my TPT store. I clicked here in the little category, digital guided reading books. Um, and then I have basically like K2 levels or K through early third. If you teach third grade, you might have some um, little ones who can read some of these as well, just because I know a lot of kids are a little bit behind because they lost a chunk of their learning last year. So I have them just by level, but then I also have the bundles. Michelle says, love the club. Love having you in it, Michelle. Awesome. Okay, so I use my literacy club materials, my digital guided reading books, those have been a help. And then I also use decodable texts. And you may have some of your own. The ones that I'm using are from my phonics program, from Sounds to Spelling. And so, oops, I don't have one up. I'll show you one later. Um, I, I'm gonna go through in a little bit here. I'm actually gonna go through a lesson where I tell you exactly what we did in this lesson. And I'll show you a decodable text at that time but it comes from my phonics program from Sounds to Spelling. Again, you may have other resources for decodable text. Maybe you have access to reading A to Z. That would be another good one too. So lots of different ideas for where to find the text. And again, in a minute, we're gonna talk about how to actually get them to read it, but I am screen sharing. I use Zoom. I screen share with my student or students that I'm doing my reading group with um, and they can see the text. And sometimes I have to zoom in a little bit, but no big deal, we work through it. Okay, so this is next what we're going to talk about, I think one of the trickiest parts, um, sharing and reading the text. And this is where I think we have to say to ourselves, okay, this is what I do in a normal year. This is not a normal year. This is not normal instruction. Therefore, the way we read the text is not going to look the same. Because for me, a lot of learning to enjoy the group and, and learning to accept that like, yeah, they are actually learning and we're having fun is just accepting that it's not like a normal year. And, you know, I'm not able to pass text out hard copies and have them read them. Now, if I were able to, that would be amazing. Um, one option is if you have packet pickup or something at your school, you can give them hard copies and they take them home. Or if your kids are tech masters, which I have not attempted this, um, you could actually give them, the, you know, a text like what I was talking about with my guided reading books or you know, the passages and they could open it up in a tab and they could read. So they could each have it on their own screen or in front of them. And the advantage there is that they're able to turn the page. Now, if you do that, what I would recommend is actually having them mute or you can mute them on Zoom. I will mute them um, so you can't hear them. And their job is to whisper read. So you see their lips moving and you see them reading, but you actually can't hear anything which is very strange. We're gonna talk about other options in a moment. I know that's not what you know I would normally do, that's not what you would normally do, but so that you can't, you know, if you have a lot of kids in your group and they're all whisper reading, that might get pretty noisy, right? So you can have them or you can mute them and their job is to just whisper read the text that's either in a tab or it's right there in front of them. So this is one option. Again, not ideal, but an option, okay? Another option, you can screen share. And this is what I do. I do um, like smaller groups and I do some one-on-one. -on -one. And so for me, just screen sharing works well. Uh, they don't have to have another tab or something in front of them. Again, if you have like a number of kids and it's distracting to have them all read, they can mute. And then what, they, what I have them do is when they're ready for me to turn the page, they just put a thumbs up in front of their face. And the reason why I say in front of their face is because I've noticed that a lot of times when I'm asking my kids to show me something, their arms are like over here and they're not in front of the tablet or whatever. So I just say, show me a thumbs up in front of your, pa in front of your face when you're ready for me to turn the page. And then I'll change the page, right? Or I'll scroll down if we're doing some kind of passage. So that is an option. Again, not ideal. We're going to talk about ways for you to hear your kids read in a moment, um, but it's a way to get through the book. 
Another option, and I've done this a little bit, I don't love this, but it kind of depends on your kids. If you're working with like little, little ones, like kindergartners, where the texts are, you know, maybe like just one line per page, this can work, or a couple of lines per page, you can screen share, and then the kids, again, they mute themselves and they whisper read, but then like, I don't know, either halfway through or afterwards, you have a couple of kids read aloud. Now, I've always been taught, like, eh -eh, on the round robin reading, like, don't have them meet to read one at a time. And there are reasons for that. There's reasons, well, number one is that um, kids don't get to read a lot of the book, right? Like, they only get to read the one or two pages that they read. Um, kids, the other kids may zone out if it's not their turn to read. They don't get as much practice. They zone out. And some kids really have a lot of anxiety about reading in front of other children, especially our struggling readers. So those are three reasons why round robin reading is a no-no. However, this is a little bit different. In this option, the kids are still getting to read all of the text. It's just that you're stopping and maybe having one kid read one page and another kid read another page so that you can actually hear them reading aloud. But the kids are still reading the whole book beforehand or as you're doing this. So it's not like it's a totally cold read. They've had a moment to attempt the text themselves. Now, if I have a student who's even a little bit anxious, I will not do this. I'm just proposing this as an option. Works well if you have like a relatively small group size as well. Again, the kids are reading the whole book. You might just have them read like three pages and then you stop and you say, okay, Susie, can you read this page to us? The kid reads, then you move on a couple other pages, then a student reads, um, or maybe you read the whole book and then you go back and have them read parts up to you. It's basically option two, just with a little bit of kids reading aloud added in so that you can kind of hear how they did with the book, because that is one of the trickiest things is we just, we want to hear how they're doing with the book because that's how we make our teaching responsive. And um, when the kids are muted, we can't do that. But this is, a, this is an option if it works for your kids. Option four is what I like to do with my little, little ones or my ones that are struggling a bit. Um, you can screen share just again, like I talked about before, and we will do either a choral read or an echo read, and then we will do an independent read. So like my little ones that are just learning to read, we might have, I don't have an example here, but we might have one of my kindergarten literacy club books up where there's only like a sentence or two on each page. And um, uh, a choral read would be the whole group reads together. Sometimes a little cringy with the, the volume and the timing being off, but it works. You can do a choral read um, all the way through and then the kids on their own, or you can do it as a group, would whisper read the text to themselves afterward. Another option is echo read, where you read a page and the kids read the same page and then you turn the page, right? The kids read a page, that page, and then, I'm sorry, you read that page and then the kids read the page, turn the page. You read the page, the kids read the page. For a book like this, I wouldn't do it because it would take way too long. This is most appropriate for when you have lower kids, lower levels, you're reading a shorter book, um, or if you're just reading, maybe, you know, maybe you just do like one paragraph of a passage as a choral read or an echo read. That's actually a good support that I like to do even, you know, in normal teaching situation. If you feel like you need to give the kids a little jump start on a passage, you can choral read or do an echo read for like the first little paragraph and then that can kind of get them going and then they read the rest of the paragraph. So that is an option, that's a support. Mostly I do that with my younger ones at the lower levels. Okay, Jill says, would option four be best for your RTI readers? Um, yes, Jill, definitely depends on what level they are. But the nice thing about the choral or echo read is that they get to hear like that more fluent reading, right? Another option, we'll call it option five, is to if you switch it. So you could have an independent read and then you can go back and do either a choral read or an echo read. So you can have them attempt it for the first time on their own, but then you go back and you allow them to hear a more, you know, fluent reading with the group, with you, whatever. So that's an option too. So there's lots of options and, you know, none of them are exactly like I would do it in a typical setting. But just know that you do have these options and it's okay for it not to work exactly like a normal, quote unquote, small group. Um, I haven't been able to read all of the comments, but some other people might have some good suggestions for how they 
do how they make this happen. Um, it's not like a normal group, but all of these can work for sure, depending on your kids, their level and their needs. All right, so we were talking about one of the challenges being that you can't hear your kids as well, you know, or understand how they're doing as well. Option three helps with that. Option four can help with that a little bit, um, but here are some other things that can be helpful. So you can have your kids record themselves reading and send that to you. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. You can just do like a voice memo if you can get your kids to do that, which can even be done on like a parent's phone. You can, I believe you can do it via Seesaw. You can have them record their voice. Um, you just have to kind of tell the parents like, hey, I'm not looking for perfection. Have your kids practice one time and then read it and that's it. We kind of have to like prep the parents so that they know that, you know, we're not looking for um, the most astounding reading performance. What we're looking for is a genuine understanding of like how this kid is doing. So I'll always say, I want to be able to help your child. I need to know how they're doing. And I need, you know, to hear an accurate representation of that. I, you know, I don't want you to have them practice 50 times. I just need to hear how they're doing, you know, maybe practice one time, something like that. So that is an option. I saw somebody was saying where, maybe may have been Emily, where you can, you know, have the kids record themselves on reading A to Z or RAS kids, I think it is. I have not tried that, but I, I've heard of that as well. So there's lots of different options for having them record themselves and they can send it to you. And this would be outside the group, right? Like maybe you read the book together and then you send them off to read on their own and they send you the recording. Or maybe there's a different book that they read and they send you the recording just so that you get an understanding of how they're actually doing. If you have a small enough class, class size, and I know that not everybody does, one-on-one -on -one virtual meetings can be helpful. Um, so I do reading intervention and I get to meet with a lot of my kids one-on-one. -on -one. And it actually, it's actually a lot of fun. I really do feel like I get to know them. And so if you have a small enough class size and you're able to get in one-on-one -on -one virtual meetings, you will just learn so much about them as readers and really feel like you get to make that connection. So I would absolutely recommend doing that if you're able. Now, are you gonna be able to do that every week if you have a, a decent sized class? No, and you know, that's okay. But if you can do it, I would say go for it. Um, we kind of talked about this already. And then another thing, as the kids get older, higher up in the levels, you can kind of judge how they did with a book by having them respond to the text. So it could be while you're together as a group, or it could be, hey, afterward, go and do this. But either way, um, you know, they can maybe type something up, like with some of my higher levels in my guided reading books, they're actually typing something. And that can tell you like, hey, did they actually get the book or did they not? Um, little ones, maybe they can write or draw something and then take a photo or mom or dad takes a photo, they're a grown up and sends it to you via seesaw. There's different ways to get a gauge on how well they're understanding too. Okay, so now this is the part where we are going to go over an example lesson. Um, so little disclaimer, this is a real lesson that I taught. I did teach it one-on-one, -on -one, but I've taught extremely similar lessons with more than one student for sure. So we can absolutely work there. Um, second thing is that not all my, my reading small group lessons look exactly like this. This is combined phonics and reading. Um, the passage that we read in this lesson is a decodable text, but you know, like I said, I use different things. I use these that from Epic, I use these, I use read words, a variety of things, depending on the kid and or kids. And um, not all of my lessons look exactly like this. You may have other things that you need to or want to include in your small groups and that's okay. This is not the end all be all. It's not a perfect 100% flawless lesson, but this lesson worked, I taught it. It's very simple. And um, I like to think of it as BYOE, bring your own engagement. So can I do all the fun games and activities like I might like to in person? No, I haven't found a way to do that. But I try to bring my own, or I think I said bring my own engagement, but I meant bring my own enthusiasm. So um, I, you know, I bring the level of energy to the lesson. I tell the kids how happy I am to see them. I get to touch base with them personally and learn about what's going on in their lives outside of school. And so even though this is quite simple and it's not fancy, you know, we still enjoyed the lesson. So all of that said, here is what we did. The first thing we did is in the previous lesson, we had been working on ING words. This was review. 
And we, at that time, we're talking about drop the E, add the ING rule. And so in this activity, and again, this was one-on-one, -on -one, but I've taught very similar lessons in a small group, we were tapping and writing the ING words. So um, she had a whiteboard. All your kids can have whiteboards or it can just be, I've seen some teachers will take like a, a piece of paper and put it in a, a page protector little sheet thing. And then the kids can write on it with a marker and then erase. Um, so we were doing some review and I would say like, for example, baking and she would have to tap it out. It might be backwards for you. I don't know how it shows up, but it's supposed to be left to right for the kids. So for baking, it would have been like, let's see if I can do this backwards or not. B -a -k -ing. Baking. So that's your phonological awareness piece. I would say the word. I said baking. I was baking a cake. Let's tap it out. B -a -k -ing. Baking. So ing is a chunk. And so then she would write baking. And I would also, because this is a review, like if I was teaching this skill for the first time, I might have her write bake. And then we'd go through the process of like drop the E, add ING. We had already done that with magnetic letters in a previous lesson. So after she would write baking on her board, she would just hold it up in front of um, the screen and you could have a whole group of kids doing this too. When I'm working with more than one student, I will say hide it so that they don't show it. And then I'll say show it and then they'll show it. Okay, so they hold it up. And then for her, I said like, okay, what was the base word in baking? And so she would have to tell me bake. And then I would say, if I was going to write bake, what would that look like? And she'd have to tell me B-A-K-E and we'd review the drop the E and the I-N-G. So that was kind of a long explanation, but it really went pretty quickly. It just is kind of a warm up, phonologic awareness and phonics. Okay, after that, we moved into a new skill that we were gonna be talking about. And this was really targeted based upon what this child needed. And so we were talking about the R sound made by the letters AR. So this is just for my phonics program. You can of course make something like this on a Google slide or whatever. And it just, you know, we talked about, oh, I like to call this the pirate sound R had her read the word, I had her tap it out, st R, star, okay? So I introduced that. It was something that she was familiar with for sure, but that poster helped. And then we went and we read some words with AR. Um, let me find it, so hopefully I'm not making you dizzy with the scroll. So, no, this is not. We were reading a half sheet that had a bunch of AR words, sorry. I think, yeah, it was these, okay. So I zoomed in and your kids might be at the point where they can just read art or you might have them say the sounds art, art, arm, arm, far, far. So they might have to say the sounds in blend depending on what they need. Um, but we are, you know, choral reading these and I wasn't reading, she was doing the reading. But again, you can do this with a whole group of students. If you are doing it with a whole group of students and you're like, hmm, I really want to know how you know, um, Jacob is doing after you do them or before you do another one, you might say, okay, Jacob, can you do this one for us? And just have like one child try one so you can kind of get a gauge on how the, you know, how the blending, how the phonics is actually going. So we read words with AR, very simple. This is for my phonics program. And, you know, I didn't need to print it out or anything like that. I just screen shared and zoomed in, super simple. You can also accomplish that with Google Slides if you wanted to use them almost like flashcards and have a different word on different you know, slides and go through them. That works as well. Um, after that, we built, no, actually, I forget what we did. We either, yeah, I think we built words with magnetic letters, but you do not have to do this. Now, if you are able to get your kids a set of magnetic letters, and you can make them too. I actually, I have a blog post. It's learning at the primary pond.com. Um, let me see if I can find this. It shows you how to do DIY magnetic letters somewhere. I'll just stick this in a comment in case anybody needs it, but um, DIY magnetic letters. So in case you need that, that's there in the comment. But um, if you can get your kids either, even if it's just paper letter tiles, it talked about that in the blog post, so that they have a set at home for word building, it's super helpful. So when we're building the word, like if the word was snarl, I would say, okay, the word is snarl, repeat, should say snarl. And then I'd say, actually, I think usually I say the sentence first, I say, okay, to snarl is to make it sound like this. <sighs> you might've heard a dog do it or something like that. And then I'll say, okay, say snarl, snarl. Now tap it out, snarl, snarl. Okay, now make snarl. So then we'd build it. I 
would be building, the kids would be building. And again, you don't have to do this with magnetic letters. It can just be letter tiles as well. Some teacher told me that she was doing it, I think with like maybe Velcro or something like that. And that worked well for her. So we would, we'd build it and I would say like hide it and then they weren't supposed to show it. And then I'd say show it. And then regardless of what everybody had put up, I would say, okay, tell me the sounds and tap. So they'd have to tell me snarl, snarl. Okay, so the reason why I do this is because it helps them. And sometimes I don't even show them mine yet, depending on the kid or depending on the group. Um, it helps them connect like this is the sound and this is the letter or group of letters that makes that sound. So I'll have them tap it back. And in that process, a lot of kids will realize like, oops, I made a mistake. So I don't like to just say, okay, fix it if you got it wrong. I like to actually have them go back, say the sounds, connect them to the letters, and then fix it if they need to. So that's what we do. And then sometimes we'll talk about it too. And I'll be like, okay, like what's the R controlled, ver uh, what's the R controlled bell, A-R? Um, in this word, what says N? They'll tell me N says N. If it's, you know, a different scale, it might be like, what's the vowel team? What's the digraph? What's the vowel? Depending on what we're working on, we'll talk about the word a little bit. So we made a series of words with our magnetic letters. Pretty simple. This I actually think that I did after the reading, now that I think about it. <clears throat> um, so we're going to paste that here. Messed up my lovely little slide here. But that is the accurate order that we did it. Um, so next up, we read a decodable text that had a lot of the AR in it, and that was from the same phonics week here. Okay, so Emily, meanwhile, while I'm scrolling, Emily says, I have kiddos who say all the sounds and then blend. How do you help them to move from having to do that to seeing a word and say it smoothly without sounding it out? So some of that, Emily, is just time and fluency, and so like, I'm not going to scroll back up because it'll take me forever to get back down. This is not even the right thing. Um, like with these, you can have them read a sheet like this more than once. And so getting that fluency up there, you know, it might take them. So I do have some some kids that they're gonna they're gonna try to blend every time, but I'll try to get them to either say it more smoothly, like star, you know, star, and just rereading it over and over, it does help a little bit. So I like these really simple, not fancy half sheets that we do um, because it helps a little bit. But for some kids, yes, I absolutely have kids that, that you know, do that over and over again without smoothly reading the word. Okay, so this was the text that we read. It was pretty short, so it worked well with the time. Sometimes, again, I'll do longer text, like this one is longer, um, the epic is longer, this can be longer depending on the level, but this is, oops, this is what we read with the lesson and it had a bunch of R-controlled words. Um, and so we read it and then we, again, I was doing this one-on-one -on -one, and, and if you're doing it small group, you can do one of these options for however you want to read it. Afterward, we talked about, we did a retelling. We talked about a couple of things in the text, like, um, or actually I pointed out she did something great where she was trying a different vowel sound because the one vowel sound that she tried did not work. And so I pointed that out and really praised her for that. Um, we talked about some of like the the expressions or idioms in here, did the retelling, some comprehension. And then I also, oh, they also, or it was just her for this one lesson, she was finding words that had a R in it. So even though, you know, she wasn't able to highlight or anything, she was telling me, oh, Marcus has a R, Cart has a R. So she was connecting what we were doing with the phonics piece to the actual text. So we were doing that. And then afterward, we did a two syllable word with a R in it. So this is great because a lot of times when we're teaching spelling, um, the kids are just working with one syllable words, which is helpful, right? It's important. They've got to start with one syllable words, but we want them to also be able to read multisyllabic words as well. So my goal for this little short activity at the end was to get her to transfer her knowledge of AR to read a two syllable word. And I also knew that she had experience with AR before. I knew it wasn't totally new to her, so you might not do this the first time you introduce a pattern if you've got little ones. But so what I did is I wrote this word on the board, or on my board, and then I, I um, had heard, I have the whole group copy it down on their own board, so they just copy it, and they're not supposed to say what the word is, and then they already knew how to break the word up. So they would circle the vowels, and in this case, it would be AR as one vowel. I have them circle it together because the the sounds are like merged, right? And then the E, they would label the vowels with B, 
the consonants in between with C and C. I have them underline. And then I have them break the word into two. So then she reads the first syllable, arm, harm, less, less, harm, less. So from there, we were able to talk about, okay, what does harm mean? What does less mean? So it was like a mini, mini vocabulary lesson with um, that suffix discussion as well. We just did one. And then, you know, as homework, you could have the kids reread the text and then write about it independently. So like, this one had a question about it that they could read or, um, I'm sorry, write about after they reread it again. So that was the lesson. Again, very simple. Not all my lessons look exactly like this, but my purpose was to have a phonics focus and also get in some um, little vocabulary, some comprehension, some reading practice. Some of my lessons are more reading heavy. If it's like a longer book, you know, we may spend more time breaking up words in the text. We may spend more time reading and talking about the text. This was a little phonics heavier and I kind of um, base it on what the kids are needing and also just if I've done a really phonics heavy lesson the next one might be a little more comprehension heavy so they're definitely not all the same. Okay a couple of things that I have found. Emily Nair. Yeah orthographic mapping is great too. Um, so a couple of things I found that help with keeping kids engaged because it's just not the same with doing it in person, right? Uh, we do a lot of thumbs up, thumbs down. And so you can, of course, what I tell them is thumbs up, thumbs down right in front of your face so that I can actually see it. So this can be done in a variety of ways. Like I was working on a digraph SH with some kids. So I would say, okay, the word is shark. Repeat, they say shark. A lot of repeat it and that's good too for keeping them engaged. And then I'll say, okay, does shark have the sh sound, thumbs up, thumbs down. So they do that. Um, you can do, do two words start with the same sound. Do they end with the same sound? It doesn't even have to be phonological awareness. It could be comprehension. You know, after we read this, I could say a fact or something that's not a fact. Is it true? Yes. About seals and seal lines or is it not true? I might tell them, you know, something from the text. Yes. And then I might tell them, I might intentionally confuse something. Oh, well, a sea lion, um, doesn't have ear flaps. Is it true or is it not true? And they have to tell me thumbs down. So it's just all about getting them to engage as much as possible. Um, I have a lot of repetition. You probably heard me say the word repeat often um, just because it's like succinct. I say repeat, they repeat whatever I said. Um, I also try to have all my slides and materials all pulled up and ready to go. So I try to, you know, be on top of it, keep them, you know, keep them engaged, not distracted. I'll try to incorporate their names and interests as much as possible. Sometimes I'll take Google Slides and I'll make, you know, sentences with the high frequency words or the phonics patterns that we're working and I'll write about them. I'll write about things that interest them. So I try to do that as much as possible. Um, I try to incorporate more discussion and interaction than I might in a normal small group setting. This didn't necessarily, like the way I showed you didn't have a lot of interaction, but I might ask them when we do farm, I might take the time and ask, hey, have you ever been to a farm? Whereas if I'm teaching them in person, I'm, I might not intentionally slow the lesson down like that just because I don't want us to get distracted. But, you know, I also need to get them engaged. So I feel like if they're zoning out, I want to ask them little questions, try to learn about them and get them talking. We also do a lot of um, virtual high fives. So silly, but if they're, you know, I feel like they're doing a good job, you know, virtual high five. Um, there's different cheers you can do too. They can cheer for each other. They can do the wow cheer. So W-O-W. Wow, um, you can do like tiny clap, you can do round of applause, just different ways to celebrate them and keep them having fun. And it's so fun when they want to cheer for each other. Like if, you know, I point out that a child has used this strategy and we talk about it, they like to give each other a little clap or a little cheer. And, and that just promotes that community sense, which we definitely don't have as, as nicely as we might in the classroom. That helps a little bit. Okay, so some other tips. Um, Michelle, so glad that the digital leveled books are working for you. Awesome, super glad to hear that. One thing, we talked about this a little bit, but if your kids can get whiteboards and either paper letter tiles or magnetic letter tiles, this is honestly all I need. And again, I said, like I said at the beginning, are we doing anything fancy or extravagant? No, we're not, but we're getting those skills in and these two tools I find are really helpful. Um, I also like to keep a blank Google slide or PowerPoint presentation just pulled up ahead of time so that if I want to type something in there for them, I can very quickly do that. We also talked a little bit about using slides as virtual flashcards. Um, 
you also, I really love my document camera. I'm not gonna share what it looks like right now, but you can project whatever is on your desk underneath it. I ended up getting mine for like presenting um, with teachers, but this actually works really well with kids as well. And so I'm not gonna show you right now, but we'll do a blending drill that's, that's great for, um, actually what Emily was asking about is getting kids to be a little bit more fluent with, with blending. And I'll put all my cards on the little table here or on my desk right here and they can, you know, blend right there. Document camera is super helpful for that. But I've also seen where teachers have like used their iPad or their phone as a document camera to show their kids what's on the table. So if you can Google, you know, how do I use my phone or how do I use my tablet for, uh, for as a document camera, Google that. There'll be like YouTube videos and stuff to help you if you don't have a document camera. And then last but not least, just a little reminder, you can still teach many of the same skills as you would in a normal small group, but the way that you teach them are pro is probably going to need to look a little bit different and that's okay. Really to me, virtual teaching, you know, am, am I going to quit teaching in person and go virtual after this year? No, I know that it's not for me and that's okay. Some teachers do that and that's amazing, but I know that we can still have fun when we're in a small group. I can keep things simple. And what I was showing you here actually didn't take that long to prep, right? Like I do have my phonics program, which helps my, you know, my kids do have the whiteboard and the magnetic letters, which helps, but this didn't take a lot of time for me on my part to set up. Um, and we still had fun. So BYOE, bring your own enthusiasm. I, I forgot to, I don't think I put this on here, but I, I meant to tell you that at the beginning of each lesson too, I will ask them, you know, how are they doing? I'll tell them I'm so excited to see them. Like, what did you do over the weekend? I'll ask them all kinds of things and maybe make more time to chat than I would ordinarily if I was in person. Um, I do a lot of that anyway because I do reading intervention and I really want to build that relationship and learn about them as little people. Um, but I make time for that in small group because that's my opportunity to get to know them better. So before we do any of this academic stuff, you know, I didn't mention it here, but I'm asking, you know, how was your weekend? What's new? All this stuff, following up on if they knew they were going to go to the zoo or whatever they were doing. Maybe not right now, but whatever they were doing on their weekend, we'll chat about it. So that's all I've got for you. If you are watching this later on, feel free to leave a comment or a question. I'm happy to come back and answer them. If you missed the beginning, this should get posted to my Facebook page, Learning at the Primary Pond, so that you can rewatch if you need to. If you have a teacher friend who has been struggling with teaching small groups, I would absolutely love for you to share because I know that it's just a hard time right now. And if this is able to help someone else, that would make me so happy. I did put the links in the little text or whatever. So I gave you the links to my digital guided reading books, which were these things. I have them in kindergarten through second grade levels. Um, and I gave you the ReadWorks link and I gave you the Epic link. And I think that's it. Oh, I also, I believe I gave you a link to my phonics program, which is a lot of the stuff that I was showing you in the sample lesson. That's where that came from. All right, Jill, I'm so glad that this was helpful. Thank you for watching. Stacy. the digital books in, you're welcome. Okay, I guess I answered your question. Yeah, they're in my TPT store, learning at the primary pond. Thank you, Michelle. All right, well, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions or anything that I didn't answer, feel free to leave it in the comments. Um, take care of yourself and happy virtual teaching. <laughs> Bye everybody.